Physical inactivity has been called the biggest public health problem of the 21st century. Of course, just because someone calls it that doesn't mean it's true. In fact, physical inactivity ranks down at number five in terms of risk factors for death, and number six in terms of risk factors for disability. Diet is by far our greatest killer, followed by smoking. But still, there is irrefutable evidence of the effectiveness of regular physical activity in the prevention of several chronic diseases— cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, obesity, depression, and osteoporosis, as well as premature death, adding an additional one or two years onto our lifespan, helping to add years to our life and, above all, life to our years. It truly may be survival of the fittest. How much do we need to exercise? In general, the answer is the more the better. Currently, most health and fitness organizations advocate a minimum of 1,000 calories burned of exercise a week, which is like walking an hour a day, five days a week. But seven days a week may be even better in terms of extending one's lifespan. Moderate intensity can be practically defined by the talk-but-not-sing test, where you can still carry on a conversation, but would feel breathless if trying to sing. Exercise is so important that not walking an hour a day is considered a high-risk behavior, alongside smoking, excess drinking, and being obese. Having any one of these effectively ages us three to five years in terms of risk of dying prematurely. Though interestingly, those that ate green vegetables on a daily basis did not appear to have that same bump in risk. Uh, but even if broccoli-eating couch potatoes do live as long as walkers, uh, there are a multitude of ancillary health benefits to physical activity, so much so that doctors are encouraged to prescribe it, to signal to the patient that exercise is medicine, in fact, powerful medicine. Researchers at the London School, Harvard, and Stanford compared exercise to drug interventions, and found that exercise often worked just as well as drugs for the treatment of heart disease and stroke, the prevention of diabetes. Of course, there's not a lot of money to fund exercise studies, so one option would be to require drug companies to compare any new drug to exercise. In cases where drug options provide only modest benefit, patients deserve to understand the relative impact that physical activity might have on their condition. We could throw diet into the mix, too. Yes, the FDA could tell drug companies, your new drug beats out placebo, but does it work as well as kale? Right now, almost two-thirds of Americans are overweight and by 2030 more than half our population may be clinically obese. Childhood obesity has tripled, and most of them will grow up to be overweight as well. The United States may be in the midst of raising the first generation since our nation's founding that will have a shorter predicted lifespan than that of the previous generation. The food industry blames inactivity. We just need to move more. But what is the role of exercise in the treatment of obesity? There is considerable debate in the medical literature today about whether physical activity has any role whatsoever in the epidemic of obesity that's swept the globe since the 80s. The increase in calories per person is more than sufficient to explain the U.S. epidemic of obesity. In fact, if anything, the level of physical activity over the last few decades has actually gone up in both Europe and North America. This has important policy implications. Yes, we still need to exercise more, but the priorities for reversing the obesity epidemic should focus on the overconsumption of calories. To work off the increased caloric intake, which for kids is like an extra can of soda and small fries compared to what they were eating back in the 70s, and for adults like an extra Big Mac a day, to work that off, we'd have to walk like two, mo two hours a day, seven days a week. So exercise can prevent weight gain, but the amount required to prevent weight gain may be closer to you know, twice the current recommendations. Public health advocates have been experimenting with including this kind of information, the fast food menu labeled with calories and the number of miles to walk to burn those calories appeared to be most effective in influencing the selection 
of lower calorie meals. Now, exercise alone may have a small effect, and that small effect can make a you know, big difference on a population scale. A 1% decrease in BMI nationwide might prevent millions of cases of diabetes and heart disease, thousands of cases of cancer. Yeah, but why don't we lose more weight from exercise? It may be because we're just not doing it enough. I mean, the, the small magnitude of weight loss observed from the majority of exercise interventions, you know, where they make people exercise, may be primarily due to how low the doses are of the prescribed exercise. People tend to overestimate how many calories are burned by physical activity. For example, there's, uh, there's this myth that a bout of sexual activity burns a few hundred calories. So hey, you could get a side of fries with that. But if you actually hook people up and measure, en measure energy expenditure during the act, and your study subjects don't get too tangled up with all the wires and hoses, though it may be nearly the metabolic equivalent of calisthenics, given that the average bout of sexual activity only lasts about six minutes, a young man might expend approximately 21 calories during sexual intercourse. Of course, he would have spent roughly one-third of that just lying around watching TV, just basal metabolism. So the incremental benefit is plausibly on the order of 14 calories. So maybe we could have like one fry with that. During World War I, it was discovered that many of the chemicals for the new explosives they were working on had toxic or even lethal effects on the workers in the munitions factories chemicals such as dinitrophenol, or DNP, boost metabolism so much workers were found somewhere along the road after work covered in sweat, with a temperature of 106 degrees Fahrenheit, or even 109 before they die. And then even after death, their temperatures keep going up like a total body meltdown. But at subacute doses, workers claim to have grown thin to a notable extent after several months working with the chemical. That got some Stanford pharmacologists excited about the promising metabolic applications of DNP. One dose, and a resting metabolic rate jumps up 30%, an actual fat-burning drug. People started losing weight, no apparent side effects, as a result of their weight-reducing treatment. On the contrary, they felt great, until thousands of people started going blind, and users started dropping dead from hyperpyrexia, fatal fever from the heat created by the burning fat. Of course, it continued to be sold. Here at last is a weight-reducing remedy that will bring a figure men admire and women envy without danger to your health or change your regular mode of living. No diet, no exercise. It did work. But the therapeutic index was razor thin, a razor thin difference between the effective dose and the deadly dose. It was not until thousands suffered irreversible harm that it got pulled from the market. Until, of course, it was brought back by the internet for those dying to be thin. There is a way. Our body naturally burns fat to create heat, though. When we're born, we go from a nice tropical 98.6 in our mother's womb straight to room temperature, and we're all wet and slimy. This represents a challenge for thermoregulation, for maintaining our warm body temperature. As an adaptive mechanism, the appearance of our unique organ around 150 million years ago allowed mammals to maintain our high body temperatures. That unique organ is called brown adipose tissue, or BAT, whose role is to consume fat calories by generating heat in response to cold exposure. Uh, the white fat in our bellies stores fat, but the brown fat, uh, located up between our shoulder blades, burns fat. It's essential for the thermogenesis, the creation of heat in newborns, but it's considered kind of unnecessary in adults, has been considered unnecessary, who have you know, higher metabolic rates and increased muscle mass for shivering to warm us up if we ever get cold. So we used to think it was just, just kind of shrank away when we grew up. But if it was there, then it could potentially make a big difference for how many calories we burn every day, but supposedly we outgrew it. But when PET scans were invented to detect metabolically active tissues like cancer, oncologists kept finding hot spots in the neck and shoulder regions that on CT scan turned out to be not cancer, just fat. Then some observant radiologists noticed they appeared in patients mostly during the cold winter months. And when we looked closer at tissue samples taken from people who had undergone neck surgery, we found it—brown fat in adults.
The common message from these studies is that BAT is present and active in adults, and the more we have, the more active it is, the thinner we are. And we can rapidly activate our fat-burning brown fat by exposure to cold temperatures. For example, you hang out in a cold room for two hours in your undies and put your legs on a block of ice for four minutes every five minutes, and you can elicit a marked increase in energy expenditure thanks to brown fat activation. So hey, these studies point to a potential natural intervention to stimulate energy expenditure, turn down the heat, and burn calories, and reduce your carbon footprint in the process. But thankfully for those of us who would rather not lay our bare legs on blocks of ice, our brown fat can also be activated by some food ingredients, such as those we'll cover in the next video.